Hello, it's good to see you. Welcome back, everybody. We are just going to start with a, a little introduction of everybody because our, our next panel is called The Making of Myths. And um, we're very, very honored and pleased to have Victor and I, Justin Gerard, and Ian McKay with us uh, to talk about this. But uh, just a little background. So Greco-Roman sculptures of mytho mytho mythological figures carved thousands of years ago expressed the power of the gods and of the myths themselves. These ancient tales have been favorite subjects of poets, storytellers, sculptors, painters, and illustrators throughout history and into modern times. Our panelists will discuss their interest in mythology and approaches to portraying capricious gods and other figures who entice humans to perform impossible tasks. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to the artists. Born in Hong Kong, Victor and I studied art at the Rhode Island School of Design. And in her career, she has won numerous awards and accolades from her peers for her bold color palette and inventive designs. In 2018, Victor was the recipient of the Spectrum Gold Award for book illustration and was awarded the Advertising Gold Medal from the Society of Illustrators the following year. She has illustrated advertising campaigns for McDonald's, Apple, Johnny Walker, American Express, and numerous other companies. Justin Gerard's fantasy paintings exhibit a bold color palette, inventive composition, and terrific wit inspired by the artworks of Arthur Rackham, Palmer Cox, Maxfield Parrish, and the golden age of illustration illustrators. The works of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis have remained constant sources of inspiration for him throughout his career. His clients have included the Jim Henson Company, Warner Brothers, Harper Collins, and Random House, among many others. And his work has been featured in Spectrum, the best in contemporary fantastic art, and the Society of Illustrators Annual of American Illustration. Over the past 30 years, Ian McCaig has designed concept art, storyboard art, and designs for several blockbuster movies. He began his career in cinema, creating artwork for Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Hook, and Interview with the Vampire. In 1999, he was hired as a principal designer for the three Star Wars prequel films, as well as the more recent Star Wars movies. He has also created concept art and design for the Spiderwick Chronicles, John Carter, The Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers, Infinity War, and others. Welcome, we are so happy to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you forgot to mention I was a stormtrooper in Empire Strikes Back. Oh my gosh, I somehow missed that fact. I did not yeah. realize that. <laughs> that's a pretty amazing fact. Yeah, that's so cool. Very uncomfortable costumes. <laughs> oh, I was, was going to ask, were you able to breathe? Uh, they just couldn't hear. Oh. You know, they, they'd yell action, I'd be waiting. <laughs> and they'd tell you where to go and you can't, no wonder those guys can't shoot. You can't see yeah. anything in those helmets either. <laughs> Well, if they look poor, so that's what it matters. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're going to be, uh, you know, asking some questions here, but we invite our viewers to uh, put their own questions into the chat or the Q&A, and uh, we will bring them forward. And what we'd also like to do is to um, kind of stream some images in the background of the amazing work that these artists have done. And... Um, we'll be able to stop along the way and ask them a little bit more about, um, about what they created. So um, I might just start with uh, a question for all of you. And um, you know, how did you become interested in storytelling? Uh, were illustrated books important to you as children? Were you, um, you know, encountering works of art? What, what was it and how did you get there? Uh, I can go first. Great. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I started drawing kind of by accident. Um, my family moved around a lot. I actually attended like six different kindergarten. Um, because of that, I didn't have any friends, sadly, in my childhood. And my oh. parents were both very busy working um, parents. And I, I will go to my mom's office after school 
and um, she was the editor at a newspaper company. And then all she had a layer around were paper and pen. Um, so that was what I did. I started drawing to kill time and to entertain myself. Um, and that's how I started the journey. And um, I guess because there weren't any kids around my age to play with, I started inventing, you know, friends on paper that I will go to adventures with. Um, and I guess that's my, you know, early entry into the fantasy realm. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. And I, since we have this beautiful piece on the screen, I wonder if you would want to comment upon this. Sure. Yeah. Um, this piece is actually about uh, reserve savings for like a financial magazine, believe it or not. Um, so it's about being resour uh, resourceful and uh, save up for, you know, the harsh days, um, especially, you know, for family. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very honored to be invited, but I also feel like kind of an imposter on this panel Aww. because a lot of the work, you know, I do are actually uh, for, like not for fantasy clients, um, but I think fantasy just become like a language that I, I like to use to tell story and to solve the solutions. Thank you. Absolutely beautiful. We're so happy to have you here. Um, Justin, would you like to talk about your beginnings in storytelling and uh, tell us how you got involved? Sure. I, I actually, I, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint a time that, that uh, you know, that got me started on, on this path. Safe to say that my story is probably similar to Victo's uh, in that uh, parents moved around a lot and ended up, uh, you know, hanging out by myself, just drawing quite a bit. And uh, in a similar situation, my grandmother worked at a print shop and sent me a box of paper one year. Wow. And so for an entire summer, all I did was was draw. And I, I don't remember much of those drawings. I mean, they're all terrible, but, and they've long since been burned uh, as is my <laughs> yearly ritual to, to burn anything that doesn't sell. Um, but I do remember, I remember there were a few that like really, I, I felt, that this was it, uh, that this was the thing I had to do for the rest of my life after having drawn it. I, I remember one in particular where I, I drew, it was a tiny little fish swimming in a giant sea. And there's a little, and then I drew a bigger fish after that fish. Then there was a, even a more giant fish after that fish. <laughs> and there's, you know, it's this sort of, this tragedy of, of nature and life about to t uh, transpire here. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, I drew a tiny little alligator diving in between to intervene <laughs> between all of this to save the little tiny bright colored fish. And he was going to die. He was going to be killed. It was for certain on, in my crayon scribbling there. And, uh, uh, but there was, there was something beautiful about that. And, and then up in the right corner of the paper, I had scribbled a sun. And that sun was beaming hearts down on, on the, uh, the alligator so that his sacrifice had not gone unnoticed by by the great tragedy of nature. I remember uh, not sure what had just happened when I had made it, but knew that this was it. Whatever this is, I'm going to find this in my future. And this is gonna, I'm gonna have this with me. I need this as part of my life from for here on out. That's wonderful. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, and this is this amazing apocalyptic scene. Can you say a little bit about it, Justin? Um, uh, yeah, I, I have to thank um, the people who've kind of supported me on, on Patreon and Twitch for this. Um, I, during the, the pandemic, kind of didn't know what to do with myself, like many of us, I guess, like who had been interacting with our friends and our community, our tribe in many ways, um, at conventions and shows and galleries, and then suddenly we're not allowed to. Um, and uh, we're stuck at home and uh, probably spinning our wheels, losing our minds. And so I started doing more online stuff. And, and this was part of it, um, doing just painting and talking to people uh, who are watching while live streaming. Um, and so I can't say much about what the story is here other than this is probably just me processing uh, you know, emotions that were going on during that time as we kind of were all getting used to this new, yeah. new normal in the world that was. Um, and, uh, and anyway, I was having fun kind of just, uh, painting with, with like-minded people online. And this is one of the products of it. Wow. That's really wonderful. So you were painting and live streaming at the same time. 
Uh, yeah, I, I've I, ever since the pandemic started, I I felt that I I I was missing that element of community mm -hmm. that I had had before, and so this was kind of my way of uh, approximating it. And now that we're even coming out of the pan pandemic a bit, and and people can start to get back out and go to these shows again, thankfully. I'm still probably going to keep doing it. I, I find right. that it's, it is actually a very enjoyable thing. And perhaps it is going to be part of the, the world moving forward that uh, we are a little more interconnected online. I mean, this, what we're doing today is a great example of it, that we're able to, to reach uh, our community uh, and interact with our community in this way, I think is wonderful. Absolutely. We are so fortunate to have hundreds of people online and we would not have been able to do that if we were just live. So you're right, that's one of the great advantages of this format. Ian, welcome. Um, tell, tell us how you got started in, in sort of moving towards art and fantasy uh, themes. Love to, love to hear about that. It's, it's a little different. We, we moved around maybe every three or four years and then settled in Canada. My parents are from up here. And I, was, uh, I did most of my first things in the town that I live in right now. Um, I disappeared for 30, 40 years. It took me to get back here to actually buy a house, and and this is home though. Um, but I've never, I've never been in just one place. The pandemic is the first time that I've not traveled in a year. Um, I work where the films are. I work where London, in London, or in Australia, or LA, or San Francisco, or wherever it happens to be. And um, wherever I go, I end up in a room like this one, and in front of a drawing board. And when you're drawing, you're never alone. You're there with a host of characters and they're noisy and crazy. And usually for me, it, I love to stagger outside the studio and just see nature and see real people again. Um, so not a lot has changed for me, actually. I'm still in a room like this. I still stagger out and see nature. And I'm very, very lucky in Victoria because it was, it's kind of been like New Zealand on the island here. We haven't had a lot of cases people have <clears throat> always masked up and been very careful and stuff so we're able to see each other on the streets and walk through the woods and all those things and so um it the the horrible thing is standing this far away from the rest of the world and watching the terrible things that are happening the catastrophes are happening everywhere because the pandemic is it is it is up there with the worst of mythological nightmares Mm -hmm. And to be outside the window watching that happen to all the people you love, it's been hard. Um, Very true. How, how I started drawing was just, uh, I wasn't going to be an artist ever. I didn't take art in school until quite late. I just assumed everybody drew, right? Because the <clears throat> first thing I remember is holding a pencil. I think my dad was trying to write an exercise book for men, women, and children little children wow. in the in the 50s and 60s and nobody women didn't exercise back then as far as the bodybuilding world was mostly concerned so this was a groundbreaking book what made it really groundbreaking is he's um he wanted everyone to be wearing kilts because <laughs> <laughs> he's very scottish wow. and, and i was raised you know <clears throat> playing in a bagpipe band and i wore a kilt and i highland dance over swords and things like that so nobody would illustrate it so he had to teach himself to draw and I was very, I was three and I would hide under his drawing board and curses and pencils and paper would rain <laughs> down from above as he tried to teach himself <clears throat> and all these art books everywhere because um, he didn't know where to start so I had all these things and I would just look at them and copy them draw them and I think that's how I, I started um, but again since dad was doing it and I was doing it I assumed everybody did it so my great love was books. And I read, I still do, I read voraciously. Um, it doesn't need to have pictures because I do the pictures. Mm. And the reason I love books so much is my head fills up with images and then I run to a piece of paper and pour them out before my head blows up. And I think that's really where it all came from. For years and years and years, I was just this illustrator of everything I read. <coughs> Sorry, oh. losing my voice, just a sec. And we've got a very famous character on the screen. Oh, he was, about this? I drew him long before the Gandalf from the films. Mm. Um, and that, again, it was, 
like Justin was saying, I just did this for fun. This is for a birthday card for my daughter. Mm. There's a little little golem in the corner going, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. But, but I was going to say, and Victor, it's it was about your image as well, that it doesn't really matter what it's for, right? My mythology and fantasy and all this, it's just a, a wonderful costume we get to put on real life. And you get to talk about some really dark and serious and, and uplifting and wonderful things. You know, strong emotion makes us back away anyway. Mm -hmm. But if you put these costumes on, people stay because they're entertained and the, they're delighted too. They just have to get closer and see what is that? And so you can talk very intimately about all kinds of things. That's what fairy tales were for. Yeah. You know, they were, that's mm -hmm. why they're going into woods and meeting horrible wolves and fighting terrible giants. Is, those right. were realities to the people yes. back then. Absolutely. So, and they, we still have those realities. We still have all those terrifying things. Um, the right. strange thing for me is that a long time ago, Fairy tales were for everybody. You know, you the family would go watch a, a hanging and then they would come and sit around the fire and they tell stories. Um, today we're very protective of what we call childhood. <clears throat> and we don't let them see certain things. They don't talk about certain things. And it doesn't feel doesn't feel right to me because um, kids experience darkness just as much as we do um, and understand it even less. So I think these kind of stories are even more important for them. Right. Absolutely. And actually, that leads to a, a question um, that has come in, which is, um, you know, are these archetypes that you are uh, painting and presenting uh, helpful for people today? What do they represent to us? Justin, you've got this amazing work on the screen. I wonder if you would maybe want to address that and say a little bit about this piece. Uh, yeah, this is inspired by Tolkien um, and uh, some of the events kind of going on behind the scenes um, referenced in the Silmarillion. So, you know, uh, events directly preceding uh, those of, of The Hobbit. Um, and it, they're just really wonderful moments. I, I, the Silmarillion in general is just, uh, you could illustrate for your entire life and still not get through a tenth of it. Um, and, and it's been wonderful to watch artists try, like Ted Naismith. I, I, I love following his work um, uh, for that reason. There's just so much wonderful, interesting stuff. And like you mentioned, that, that there is um, elements that feel true to our lives now. Um, one of the things I love about fantasy art, I think, is, is its ability to personify um, psychological struggles that we have through, you know, monsters and wizards and magic and and that they aren't just um, these elements, um, you know, that you're actually this character battling some other character, but this can be a way of, of processing uh, your feelings about um, life and about your experiences with other people. And, and I think art for me for a long time, this scene included are, are me trying to process uh, my feelings about um, things I'm trying to overcome or, or think through or just understand. Um, and for me, visuals have always been the way that I've done that um, better than any other format. They've helped me kind of express those feelings and then also understand them for myself. Um, I love making images for that reason that so many times they're a journey that um, I, don't, I don't necessarily know where I'm going to end up or what's going to be revealed in the image until it's, until it's painted. Um, and so I love, I tend to really enjoy um, images of struggle, uh, of, of conflict and, and chaos. Uh, and so most of the images are going to be either the moment before the chaos or the moment of the chaos uh, uh, in, in my work. I just, I find myself more, more drawn to, to that kind of thing. And again, much of it is uh, psychological, trying to overcome something uh, mm -hmm. that you're working through in your own mind. Thank you. Victor, um, how do you how do you approach, I'm going to go to Ian next, but here's one of yours. Um, how do you approach thinking about the characterizations? Are there archetypes that you like to explore or, uh, you know, are you just uh, kind of developing things as you go? Um, well, before as, I answer that. Not necessarily being 100% clear of where they're going. 
Sure, yeah, before I talk about that, I actually want to continue the conversation that I th thought was great that Ian and Justin started, you know, about how myth is still relevant today and mm -hmm. like how it exists bigger than just the story it is telling. Like, I personally feel that a lot. I mean, from the way that I started drawing, I mean, it, it, it's in a sense, it's like an escape for me from the reality, from the small, um, you know, for wars that I was confined in as, as a kid. Um, in some way, like my mom told me, I forgot about this, but like she said, I will actually reverse what's happening in class in my drawing. Like for example, if I was bullied at school that day, I will actually become, you know, like someone who like tell on, uh, not tell on, but like, like save the kid from being bullied, like uh, alternative universe that something maybe I wish had happened. Um, and I agree with Justin that so much, you know, of the struggle we see, we can project our own difficulties, you know, onto these characters and then get strength from these people. Um, and what I love about fantasy, I'm also a big fan of Tolkien. Um, although I wish not all the bad guys are dark skin and all the <laughs> good guys right. are like, you know, like <laughs> kind of like. Um, but I, I, what I love about fantasy and the archetype is that they're somehow um, abstracted and also extracted from our reality enough that um, it become universal in the sense that like for different people who see it they might be able to learn different lessons or, or um, get different messages uh, mm -hmm. from them and, and I thought that's really wonderful. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Very well said. Can I, can I actually add Ian, something? Can you jump in on that question? And sure yeah just um, uh, I've been very lucky and I love all stories, all kinds, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I don't actually read a lot of fantasy. Um, I did, but uh, these days I like, I like stories about real people and then I just put horns and wings on them and, and they sell, <laughs> sell better. And like I say, it's a disguise and you can talk about things. But I, I, um, I find that real people in real life are the best fantasy characters ever. I can't believe what we do. I can't believe what we're capable of. Um, both the horrifying things and the absolute wonderful amazingness uh, mm -hmm. that human beings are capable of too. And I find that the horrible things get talked about a lot more. Quite rightly, they're, they're very dramatic. When if you talk about a war, choices come down to black and white very often. It's the, the gray disappears and it's easier for us to talk about conflict that way. But um, I actually, when I was a kid, I had a copy of Dante's Inferno, and <laughs> it was illustrated by Dory, and it was those beautiful black and white drawings where, you know, you watch Dante go down to the different planes of hell, and, and then finally goes up to heaven. And as he's going down through hell, everybody looks like they're having a great time. You know, they're all naked and they're roiling around and everybody's like, you know, having a party. I mean, with a few pitchforks and, and suffering looks, but otherwise they look fun. And then, then he goes up to heaven and everyone's standing there like this, playing their heart, bored out of their mind. And I just, even as a kid, I thought, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. Heaven's supposed to be the awesome place. So a lot of my career is kind of dedicated to trying to portray powerful good not just powerful evil and of course if you're going to do powerful good you can't mm -hmm. cheat right and make powerful evil less so i do enjoy going in and drawing the demons and monsters and the, the terrible things but then i like to find the heaven that's stronger and more compelling and it's harder for i think for most people it's harder to draw mostly because uh, good emotions powerful emotions love even just to say the word love you feel the energy go out of the room when you're talking to film executives love it's not that kind of movie. And it's like, yes, it is. I love <laughs> good stories. I love stories. Um, and and I, I find that it's because with evil, you can disfigure good and it looks evil. With mm -hmm. good, you just have to show the thing. And the thing has to have a context or it's not good. Good is doing the right thing in the face of all the bad choices you could have made. Good is doing something kind for someone and not talking about it. You know, it's it's a strength, but it's a strength in motion. Yeah. So it's a, it's a harder thing to portray. It's one of the reasons, Victor, that I, I love your work so much. It's joyous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no matter what it is, it's just it's this beautiful 
swirls of color and in your lines and everything, I just find, you know, I find this beautiful uh, light. And Justin, it's not to disparage the battles and the darkness. You know, I love that stuff. To <laughs> Well, speaking actually, of joyous, this, this Yoda is really joyous. Tell a little bit about what it has been like to bring some of those characters to life. Well, just to give credit to Yoda here, by the way, um, Stuart Freeborn was the head of the creature department for Lucasfilm at the time. And in all the history books, Stuart Freeborn designed this. It was actually designed by, uh, the final design was designed by Wendy Froud of, of the Froud fame, Brian and Wendy. Um, and you can tell, like, it looks like a, a frown elf or creature. Mm. And uh, Stuart absolutely oversaw the department, did a lot of great sculpts too, and helped get it very close. I think he helped bring in the, the some of the wisdom into the eyes and stuff, but Wendy did the final. So, and Wendy's a good friend, and it was a real treat to take her character and try and help it into a new form. Because we're doing the prequels, and we're allowed to digitally animate this character now. So I took Yoda and I was supposed to draw Yoda from the moment he was born right through to very, very old Yoda. Uh, one point was that beard that he ties under his chin like that. Um, so this was just part of that. It was just showing the animators how Yoda could sit and talk at a slightly younger, more spry age. Don't forget he's 800 years old, so <laughs> younger still, it's really old. But um, yeah, it just it's, it's fun. I don't have to invent the character. I love to invent things, but I don't have to be the author. I get just as much pleasure out of someone handing me something and letting me put that character on and play them out, you know, perform them. Um, I love collaboration. I love before, you know, the, the internet kind of collaboration we're doing now. I love being in a room with people starting a drawing and passing it along and seeing what it comes back like. It's just, it's fun. And I, I think that's an important part of the storytelling process too. It should be fun. It should make people gasp with awe, but also go, woohoo, you know? I think that's and a I really find important that in, I find it in both of your work. It's just so powerful with emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your battles are practically falling off of the scene. They're so, you know, lively and rich and stuff. So, um, yeah, for me, that's, that's my goal in mythology and my goal in characters is to find the powerful good. So if you're responding to one, it's either because it's challenging that or it is that, but that's, that's my mission. Yeah, if I can chime in, like, I thought it's interesting that Ian said, uh, you said like fairy tale used to be for all children and now you don't feel like that's the case anymore. But I'm starting to wonder, like hearing what you say, and also, you know, of course, like the influence Star Wars has on the culture. I wonder maybe we just shifted the kind of fairy tale that our children consume. I feel like these are the modern mythologies. And um, like you said, in the end, they're all story about people. Like, you know, if you strip away the, you know, galaxy, all those, um, costume and like for, for example for me Star Wars is about it doesn't matter where you come from right even if your dad is like the most evil guy in the world like you still <laughs> decide your own destiny and what kind of life you want to live and in the end I feel like that is a fable you know that is a fairy tale yes it is for children yeah I absolutely agree with you a lot of what we do in film and so on is for everybody and whether we like it or not children watch them Right. <laughs> you know, if they don't at your house, they, they will at their friends. Yeah. And that's very close to the old fairy tales and things. So they do get to hear things and see things that are maybe older than we would think is appropriate for them. Yeah. 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 But I, I agree. Know. Star Wars is also about real people, especially the first ones, because he had come straight off of American Graffiti, which was his mm -hmm. college years, right? Mm -hmm. and it was about falling in love and having to go off to college and all those things. And all he did for Star Wars was put it in the galaxy far, far away. It's still about growing up and falling in love and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's coming up age. Yeah, coming coming up age. Up age. exactly. Um, Justin, is there uh, something of that in, in this piece? It's quite extraordinary. It's beautiful. Um, this piece, uh, I think, has more to do with, with travel um, and feeling small in a, in a giant, wonderful world full of um, tons of possibilities um you know both both good and evil but um uh it is it is about possibility and and uh 
I love backpacking. I love hiking. Um, and uh, I have, there's a group of friends I go out to a lot of the national parks with every now and then. And we'll do, uh, you know, two weeks in the back country of, you know, Yosemite or the Pacific Northwest, um, the Cascades uh, up, up in, we love going up into Washington and California. But one of, one of my favorite things is, is uh, that sense of being up on some ridge or some cliff and, and overlooking this giant world below um, and feeling small, or especially being out at night, um, out when you're away from the city and there's no light pollution and you can actually see, you know, galaxies overhead. Um, I, I love uh, that sense of, of wonder at the world. And so um, I think this is part of that. Um, again, you know, this is done sort of near the beginning of, of the pandemic. So there is a sense of like, what is coming? There's an ominous edge to a lot of these these uh, images from the series called A Plague of Dragons, um, uh, but, all, but hopefully not despair either. Like I, I, I hope that in, in all of them, there's hope still. And again, wonder at, at, uh, at the, the new world we have, because um, we do live in, in, a, uh, you know, in an amazing time, all things considered, that we are you know, talking to people across the globe instantaneously, that we're beaming pictures you know, across the globe to one another. I, I think as, as dark and ominous as it may seem, like there is something truly magical that has occurred in our lifetime. And so, you know, while these, a lot of these are certainly set within a, you know, medieval fantasy world, I hope that they capture a little of, of that wonder at, at, uh, at, I don't know where we are right now and the possibilities moving forward. Thank you, Justin. Yes, beautifully said. And spectacular work. Uh, we have a question from the audience for Victo, and I'm going to go back to the piece. I'm sorry, uh, I just want to comment on. Oh, this. please go right ahead. It's really nice. And, and, you know, the moment I saw it, I get that feeling like it's not very just simple black and white, like evil or good. It's like mixed. There's opportunity, there's danger. And I feel like that is also I mean, what I realized, like certainly growing up that like, you know, the dark and light is not two things side by side as a scale, you know, and sometimes they actually wrap around, whereas the light is sometimes if you cross the line, it becomes the darkest. It's like people say, right, like it's darker before the dawn. And it kind of reminds me, this piece actually reminds me of um, the Chinese word for danger, which is wei ji. But you, if you um, divided that two characters side by side actually mean danger opportunity. Um, so, I mean, I feel like that's also ingrained in, you know, the Chinese culture that everything has two sides. It's, it's kind of like, you know, how you play it. And then um, even with the most devastating thing, there could be something like good come out of it. And it, I don't know, like I, I saw this piece and I definitely get that, you know, like even with the overwhelming, um, you know, fire breathing dragons like you still have a little like sliver of a moon and that tranquility of this like star, starry sky behind it. Um, so I, I definitely feel like it has very, you know, like interesting mix of feelings. Absolutely, that, yeah. and that beautiful break in the clouds on the horizon with the light pouring through, it's really beautiful. Yeah, and the light is mirroring the fire. So I'm like wondering, is the village on fire or is the sun coming out and, you know, a new day starting? It's like, you a lot of questions can be asked and, generate a lot of curiosity about this piece. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question from Juan, um, who would like to know a little bit more about the creation of uh, Victor's Utopia. So I'm going to go back to that one and um, maybe see if you could fill in a few details for our viewers. Sure, yeah. Um, I feel like the creative process of this is very similar to Justin's like big fish, big fish, alligator son. Uh, it's kind of a story that, um, well, it was for a calendar project called Frogfolia, which is no longer in existence, but it's quite a like cool project by a print shop that is the themed around frogs. So it's very open-ended. Anything to do with frogs is fine. So that's the only requirement. Um, and I started thinking like, what kind of story can I tell with a frog and sort of um, considering, you know, the shape, the big belly, and one thing just led to another, and it came up with this whole elaborate story about how um, frogs are always, you know, making those 
noises like ribbit ribbit is actually trying to tell you know people hey the world is ending you need to change the way you're living but of course we're too dumb to realize it and there's like this <laughs> you know like master frog who saved the last piece of land inside his belly and sort of give human a second chance after uh the world is flooded from you know global warming rather climate catastrophe like yeah it, that's great yeah, it's just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I sure. wonder if each of you might say a little bit about your training and how you kind of came to this subject matter. Did you go to, I know that Victor, you did go to formal art school, but did, did uh, you, for example, Ian, how, how were you trained? I'm very classically trained. I, I did eventually take her art in school. It was my last year of what we call high school that was in Scotland. Um, and I went to the Glasgow School of Art. So mm. went to the Charles Rennie Macintosh <clears throat> building that's burnt down twice now, along with my thesis. No great loss there, but the building was amazing. And um, it was, uh, by then I knew I was going to be a writer, not an artist. <laughs> and I applied to an art school almost on a whim and got in there instead. And so my life kind of did this for a while where words disappeared and pictures became my principal words. <clears throat> and I was illustrating a lot of classics and getting to know a lot of stories and, and so on. So I actually, you were saying about the 30 years in film, I started in publishing. I have 10 years as a book cover, record cover artist. Uh, I did prints and things, I did advertising and all kinds of stuff. And <clears throat> it's, I still do. I still love illustrating. I still love doing pictures for words because words were the thing that were precious to me. And <clears throat> eventually, 10 years after that, I got into the film industry because they paid me enough to start writing. Mm. And I have a 30 year career as a writer as well, uh, which most people don't know because you have to be in that world. Um, I read a lot of <clears throat> screenplays. Um, I have published some books. I have two books coming out this year. I continue to take the stories in that closet back there, which is just crammed wall to wall with my stories. And congratulations. To, Can you tell us what, the closet. what books are going to be coming out? Uh, something called Once Upon a Time in a Sketchbook. So it's a sketchbook with a story. Um, I have a revised version of something called Shadowline, which <laughs> looks like my art book, but it's actually, it's a novella on an interviewer that doesn't exist that wrote the book. And he comes to get the interview from me with a secret mission of his own and mm -hmm. dis discovers all kinds of incredible things. He even kills me at one point and that brings me back to life. Um, but it's really, it's a fictional version of the creative journey. So it's what happens when, <clears throat> when an idea comes into my head and comes out the other side as a picture, what actually happens. So I dramatize that as characters and so on. And it was just to teach people how to draw and how to be creative and how to not be afraid of the big blank white page. That's, an, as you said, it's an opportunity as well as a, a you know, reflection of whatever you're feeling at the time. So um, I did four years of art school. I have an honors degree in design. Uh, I didn't learn to paint. That happened when I left. I went down to London and, and started working as an illustrator and mostly doing black and whites because I knew how to draw. Um, and then I got this commission to do a record cover for Jess Rattal, um, mm -hmm. who were a huge band at the time, still, still pretty big. And they were my favorite band. So somehow you have to just level up when one of those album cover come was that Ian? You just have to be, be better than you are. But there was a, uh, a wonderful illustrator, Brian Saunders, who just, People these days know him for the stamps he paints in Britain. But he's a wonderful teacher. And he recognizes artists that are struggling. And he saw me trying to paint. And he just called me in and said, Ian, Ian, no. Here, and he put a piece of paper up and he'd do this beautiful wash with watercolor. Let the water do the work. Here, you do it. And I would do it and he'd go, good, do it again. And he just literally had me paint beside him until I learned how to use watercolor. And thank you forever, Sandy. It's just a, what a gift. It's part of the reason I like to teach. It's part of the reason I like to give back is I've never forgotten that generosity that four years of art school didn't give me. So 
Um, this piece that was on the screen there, that was digital, but digital is just a new form of oil paint, you know, which is an alternative to watercolor. It's, it, you know, it's all ways to tell stories. And these days, by the way, I don't see any difference between pictures and words. They're the same. They both can tell stories. They both, can, you know, carry a little capsule of meaning. And it's how you put them together that tells the story. Thank you. So that's my dream. Wonderful. Justin, how about you? Were you formally trained? And uh, how did you move in this direction? Uh, yeah, I, I was, though, like Ian, I didn't really uh, start, I guess, until afterwards. Um, and I, I found that I, I just hadn't learned any enough of what I wanted. I couldn't create the things that I wanted. And so I was still casting about for how to you know, plug the gaps in my education. And, and uh, this is in the era before the internet. And uh, one of the best resources I had at the time was a, was a library that had a bunch of step-by-step -step guides. I don't know if anybody remembers that, that old step-by-step -step graphics. I remember them. But, yeah, <laughs> I so I, they had one by Peter DeSev, one by Greg Manchus. Um, and I remember I, I stole them. I stole them. And I never gave them back, not ever. I, <laughs> I literally took opportunity away from the generations that followed after me. And I have, I don't regret it. Um, they're on the shelf behind me, actually. They've been with me now 20 years. Um, I'll never give them back. Uh, one of them actually, Corey Godby stole from me. So I, uh, maybe that's, maybe that turnabout's fair play there. But um, uh, it was wonderful having those as guides. And I'm forever thankful to, uh, to Manchester and, and to Sev for their contributions to art education through those books. Um, they uh, both heavily in, informed my own work early on, and to this day, uh, they're still big influences. Um, later on, 10 years later, though, after I'd worked uh, in the industry for seven or eight years, uh, I was not getting the work I wanted. I was not happy with the work I was doing, um, had kind of like a, um, a, an existential crisis almost that, that what was I even doing with myself? Um, and uh, decided that I needed to reinvest um, into my education. And this is, again, you know, it's kind of a hard thing to do, you know, 10 years into your career, essentially. And uh, I ended up uh, going to the IMC and, and uh, the Illustration Masterclass and learning from uh, Donato and Charles Vest was there and Dan DeSantos and again, Greg Manches. And um, it was wonderful uh, spending time with them. But I would say that I studied, after that, I studied with Tom Fluharty um and Pitar Maselzia and probably that was probably the 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 best thing I ever did in my career was I you know seek out professionals who were doing what I wanted to do and and um ha had you know I I felt so much um they had figured so much out and I wanted to know how mm -hmm. um and so they were both uh kind enough to um uh give me some guidance. And I remember with Pitar, I actually spent a day in the Rijksmuseum looking at a, a painting of Rembrandt's, uh, Jeremiah uh, lamenting the burning of Jerusalem. It's kind of a small little little painting. And we sat in front of that painting for, I don't know, it was like three hours. And he just told me all his thoughts on the painting for three hours. And I think I got more in those three hours of just looking at that Rembrandt with Pitar um, than I had in you know, the previous 15 years. Um, and so, I don't know, I, uh, it's hard to say, you know, um, art education, if, if it ever ends truly, you know, I, I feel like we're all there where we're all going to be continuing to push that further as our entire lives as curious uh, individuals who want to know, like, how other artists did what they did and um, what else is possible out there. And, uh, and yeah, anyway, uh, that's all I would, I would leave that as uh, a big thank you to, to all the people who've, who've given me guidance in my career. I would not be here without you. That's a wonderful tribute for sure. Victor, how about you? What was your training like? And um, were you moving in this direction in art school or did that happen later? Um, well, I didn't have any formal training until RISD, and I honestly wasn't sure if I would even be accepted. Uh, RISD was the only art school I applied because in, well, in Hong Kong, art is not really considered a viable career option. I mean, even now it's still very difficult, very limited uh, opportunities. 
So, I mean, my <clears throat> parents are quite supportive, but they did tell me that, you know, like their point of view of the stark future if I go into it. So I thought, you know, like I should just give it a shot and apply to one of the best art school in the world. If I get it, maybe, you know, I have a chance at succeeding. Um, and luckily I got in and I was, you know, one of the poor, poorest student for the longest time. Like I, most people had, um, you know, went to art high school, had a lot of knowledge in the art history. Even now I'm so, I, I agree with Justin, I never, and I'm still learning like great artists name that I'm really supposed to know, but I'm, I'm still kind of like filling the blank into that structure and, you know, understanding how things in, influence each other and how they fit together. Um, and then, I mean, the RISTI education is, is very great. Like it, um, you know, gave me the work ethics that I have. Um, and I think the most valuable thing is giving me a community of uh, friends that I can still rely on if I, if I need uh, some suggestions, some input, some feedbacks on my work. Um, I feel like that is the hardest thing after graduating, not having the critique in class and having, like, especially if you share online, like people tend to be nice and just say nice things. And, but sometimes you just need like that honest opinion, you know, like how can I push it further? Um, what is lacking? And I feel like having that community is, is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And actually, uh, there's a question relating to your comments from Melissa Howell, who's a professor of illustration at SCAD. Um, and she is wondering uh, what advice you might actually have for uh, students these days who are interested in entering the field of illustration. Well, I feel like, I feel like the illustration landscape is ever shifting. Uh, in some way, it touches on so many different industry now, like, it, like what we're showing here is only a very small example of what illustration can do. Um, so I feel like when we're at school, like we're given a structure and we're being taught a certain way, which is great, um, but there are also many opportunities. So don't despair if you feel like you're not clicking with the class or the assignment is not interesting to you, I think it's very important to remember why you go to art school in the first place. Like no one go to art school because they want to have a Lamborghini or like a, you know, <laughs> like we love what we're doing. And like for a while, I almost lost that passion um, at RISC wow. actually, because, because I was trying so hard to catch up, you know, trying so hard to fit in um, that it at some point become not fun. Um, and uh, what saved me was actually my sketchbook like that I was doing during, you know, like liberal arts, uh, like English 101. Um, and that's what I was still enjoying. Right, so I think just remember to find a way to hang on to that passion because it's so easy to lose it, whether at school or when you just have to pay bills and take on jobs you don't love. You know, just constantly remind yourself why you're doing that. Great advice, thank you. Ian, would you like to chime in on a little bit of advice for future illustrators? Yes. Um, there's so many opportunities for artists now that didn't exist when I started. Um, games and films have bludgeoned with job opportunities. Th there's a trap there though, and that's that when you're part of a collaborative piece, and and everything you do is offered to a director who chooses whether they're going to use it or not. You can mistake that for whether it's any good or not. Um, and it can destroy, I've, I've have so many emails from young artists who say, <clears throat> I, I took your classes, I did everything you said, I have the job of my dreams, I'm the art director of this and that movie and studio and so on, why do I want to give up? And the, the answer is that you train like a Jedi, you train with all these amazing powers, and then you give it to someone else. And you never remember to give it to yourself. So <clears throat> my best advice to, to not just students, but to professional artists as well, always, always, always have a soul sketchbook. 
And that's a book. It's different from your other sketches. It's a book that every day you put something on the pages that you're passionate about, something that makes you really excited. It can be a negative emotion too, if you want. It can make you really afraid. But I, I think if you can capture joy, something you'd run naked in the snow just to see, put it in the book. And it doesn't matter how you put it in the book. Put it in by drawing it or writing it or tearing it out of a magazine or stealing it from a library. Just put it in the book. And don't look back through the book. Just do it every day so that six months from when you started, you go through and you look at every page of the book. And I guarantee <clears throat> if you were honest about what really moves you, that's a snapshot of your soul. And number one, it will keep you sane. It will help you stay centered and find who you are and stay passionate about the things you love. And number two, it'll help your job, because when you present a design like this, you know, show John Carter meeting Deja Thoris, and she's already getting married to someone else. And it's that moment where you just don't know the next step. You don't know what happens. You don't know the way forward. That came from something in my sketchbook and came from something in real life that happened to me. And I put it in there and it was happy, sad. It was bittersweet. I was happy for the person. I sat for myself. And you just take a little piece of that soul and you put it inside the design you're doing and it comes to life. So I recommend that for students. Keep a soul sketchbook always. I love the idea of a soul sketchbook. Thank you. That's so helpful. Um, how about you, Justin? Do you um, have a little bit of advice for students? Oh, let's go to that one. There we go. Uh, yeah, I, I would have said the exact same thing that, uh, that Ian and Victor <laughs> said. I, I, and it's the, the sketchbook is the, the number one thing. Uh, and, and that's one of, cause I love that it, it's one of those things that it's not necessary to be skilled, uh, to have a sketchbook. <coughs> like you need no training whatsoever. My sketchbook is, it probably looks about the same as it would have 30 years ago when I was just using stick figures. Uh, that's all you need to make, you know, compositions of incredible elaborateness and uh, capture your ideas about a scene that you may have read in Tolkien or what, where, or that you've seen in real life, but want to reinterpret. Um, all you need is stick figures to capture the essence of that idea. And then, hey, maybe 10 years later, you'll paint it. Um, if, if that's what you need, if you need to go develop the skills in order to actually communicate that scene like you want it to. But the best thing ever is to have it. So I, I can't really improve on on what Ian and Victor have said about that. So I'll, I'll add something else. And that is um, read and um, read, write and world travel are three of the most important things you can do to broaden yourself as a human being. Um, but I also think as an artist or a creative of any sort, they're they're indispensably important. Um, uh, I don't know which which of you it was who mentioned sort of filling up uh, yourself and then pouring it out um, mm -hmm. earlier. But that idea, uh, I think, is really, really important for your own work. Um, when you're in getting art education, you're going to be doing, you know, drawing formal things, tables and chairs, learning to draw squares and capture light and shadow on form. These are very, very boring things, but they're like knuckle push-ups for your artistic brain. You need them. You have to be training like this, but they're, they're not going to be fun. It's up to you to find that fun stuff and, and uh, to sort of fill your mental library with those things. And so um, I've always been a big fan of, if you can, travel, um, number one. It's, it's, it's just one of the best ways uh, to get new experiences, to broaden your understanding of humanity, of, what's, of, of, other, for, of other lifestyles, of other lives, um, the ways that other cultures live that you might never have guessed about. These things, all of these things make your work more colorful, more interesting, um, and broaden uh, your ability to communicate to, to other humans. So, and to say something interesting too. So I, I'm, uh, I'd also say get out of the, get, get away from people. As much as I would say, go travel and meet people. There's also some um, value in getting back to nature too. So uh, every background and all of my images is a place I've been including this one. Um, it was uh, the ruins of an abbey in the middle of uh, the middle of England. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the place now, but um, this image is just me trying to recreate the magic of uh, seeing that place at night. Um, 
Most of the backgrounds in my work though are places I have been and either I'm working from a photo I've taken myself or I'm just trying to recapture the magic that I felt in that place, like this scene where I had no photo because um, this was 25 years ago and no digital cameras and a Polaroid just doesn't work when you're trying to do night <laughs> photography in an old abandoned abbey. So I have to just use my memory. Um, but I, I, I find those experiences um, getting out into the, the wilderness, into uh, abandoned places, um, out into nature, out under green leaves and open skies uh, to be so important to um, uh, nourishing your art, artistic soul. So that's my advice. Thank you. Wonderful advice and comment. Um, could I add something? It's just yeah. an observation that I saw. I was like looking at the slides while you guys were talking and I noticed like, for example, Justin did a lot of dragons, but none of the dragons design were exactly the same. I feel like that's also one way that artists keep themselves interested, even if it's like a familiar uh, subject matter. And I think it was Einstein who said that creativity is intelligent at play or having fun. <laughs> and I feel like I see I see that like the kind of fun and design decision you make into like you, you have into the dragon design. Like for example, if we can go back to the one that's in the water, um, there's a dragon in oh, the water, the right? For example, this one, like the scale is much thinner and kind of like resemble that of a fish, right? Because it's like a water dragon, at least that's my interpretation. And then there's another one with the hobbit um, and like covered in gold. Like I thought it was so interesting, the dragon scale resemble gems, you know, like rubies or like sapphires. Mm. And I, I feel like for people who are in, interested in art and look long enough, these are the easy eggs that reward the audience. They understand, you know, this dragon doesn't just represent, you know, this danger, but it's also the enticement. Like it itself is also embodiment of that, you know, like lust. Um, and greed. And I feel like small details like that keep artists interested in their work and also mm -hmm. make their work much more rich for, for the audience. Thank you. Can I chime in on that too, just for a sec? Um, I, I heartily endorse the travel. And even if you can't physically travel, travel through books and the internet, but travel to other places, look at other cultures and other mythologies dragons exist in every culture of the world and they mean different things in different parts of the world um i'm actually i'm working on a project a korean project right now uh for a book that <clears throat> i don't believe has been translated outside of korea it's called the bird that drank the tears and it has a dragon and that dragon's a plant a living plant and it has a different purpose and spirit than something that is greedy and, and uh, to be feared. And it's the same uh, in China, right? The, the dragons there are, are gods and have all kinds of really wonderful um, purposes with mankind and mm -hmm. things that they give to mankind. And so um, it, you can easily get locked into something, especially by television, you know, because it refers back to a lot of European Middle Ages right. mythology totally. and I've always thought it it's really good to okay now go to India see what they were doing at the same time go her, read the Mahabharata and the Ramayana understand that in a different culture the same archetype appears but this is what it meant here, here in this place right. and that frees you up too now when you go to do your own mythology you can take an archetype but don't be bound by what you thought it was it could be whatever you, it means to you personally Thank you, Ian. Great comments. And that interconnectivity between cultures is, is so important to remember. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting close to our one o'clock hour, but there's a question here that I'd love to bring forward um, from uh, someone on YouTube. And that is, um, if you're working on personal work, um, maybe perhaps even on illustration, how do you decide which ideas are worth pursuing um, in terms of uh, you know how you're going to move forward, and how do you work with um, you know kind of yourself when there's no art director to offer commentary? <laughs> right, so I'm gagging myself because I got an instant answer. All ideas are worth pursuing. What are you talking uh, about? Yeah. All ideas. It's what you do with the idea that makes it great. 
Yeah. Right. The idea that's worth pursuing is from your soul sketchbook, right? If it didn't give you passion, if you didn't want to do it, hijack it. Find something that you do want to do and tell, make it, make it about that. But yeah, it's got to be something that has meaning for you. But any idea can work. Of course it can. Great. Yeah, I, I forgot, like, another wise people have said, like, there's no lack of good idea. There's always good ideas. Like, how do you bring the idea to fruition? Yeah. Right? How do you execute it? And what can you extract and distill from it? That's the difficult part. Great. Justin? Yeah, there's, there's uh, I, something I talk about, the, the Venn diagram of uh, what you're interested in versus what people will pay you for. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's, I think, starting out, like, yeah, you just have to do them all uh get out there and just start doing doing the ideas that are exciting to you and see which ones hit that narrow overlap uh, it's dangerous to go purely into that other side though where it's only the things that people will pay you for mm -hmm. that's when you start to lose your soul and and forget why you did this um and like victor was saying there's better ways to get a lamborghini if that's why you're here <laughs> um, you know this this isn't the industry for you if, if that's what you're yeah. after like it's it's better to stay as as far on the other side as you can but it is nice if you can find that narrow margin in between where you've hit the thing that is clearly speaking to other humans because there's something important there you know if it's something that speaks to you and it speaks to others you know there may be a reason that that that's the case and you should chase mm -hmm. that yeah i can't agree more and um i think throughout the past 10 years of me working, I also slowly realizing that you can create your own market. Like, of course, it's nice if you find like a patron or a client that just love your work instantly. But I realized that artists also can educate their audience and educate their client. Like when I was starting out, like a lot of clients, especially, you know, financial clients, they were pushing back on using metaphors with, you know, animals or mythologies to represent Wall Street. Um, but I see that changing. And of course, that's not my soul, like doing like far from it, but like our generation, I feel like of illustrator are very interesting in that and collectively kind of pushing that and you see, you know, that is changing, like the, the clients much more open to it, and they're much less literal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are all part of this organic thing that keep evolving. So what we do have an impact um, on the entire industry. Plus, I think what people universally like, right? There, there is the Venn diagram thing for sure. But anywhere, what people are interested in is truth. They don't like being lied to. They can tell when you're faking. They can tell when you're copying. They can tell when you weren't interested. Yeah. You are unique. You are special. Everyone is. And if you can honestly share that viewpoint with somebody, the truth of that will connect. Um, it's just that that's hard to do sometimes when it is a, a, an advertisement for something that has no meaning whatsoever. But for me, I grew up on, on great books and I grew up on comics. You know, I had a subscription to Superman when I was four years old. And, you know, those really don't have a lot of weighty things in terms of literature. And yet, here's a creature from another planet <laughs> who comes to Earth to help us and he has no reason he's not getting paid he's not getting his lamborghini um he's not even part of this planet why on earth would he stick around and help people and i'd like to think it's because he saw something good in us worth protecting and worth saving and right. so i took that meaning from that i gave that my truth so even if the subject even if the client if what you're doing has no meaning whatsoever bring meaning to it but bring, make sure it's your meaning, your truth, something that really resonates with you. And that I find always connects to some audience somewhere. So you're bound to be someone in the world that has that experience too. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end our discussion on. It has gone too fast because I know we could <laughs> just keep talking for a very long time, but we have been so honored to have the three of you on today to share your work and your ideas. And I just wanna remind our visitors that um, these incredible artists' work will be on view at the Norman Rockwell Museum for another week in Enchanted, a history of fantasy illustration. Uh, the exhibit will then travel to the uh, Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the Flint Museum in Michigan. So we are excited about that. Uh, can't thank you enough for being so supportive and um, 
for the beautiful work that you share with the world. Thank oh, you're you welcome. All. It was a thank gift you. to us too. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our viewers. We're so happy you were able to join us. Uh, I'll just mention we have another wonderful fantasy related show coming up. Um, opening on November 13th, we have an exhibition of the art of illustrator Jan Brett, yeah. uh, Stories Near and Far. And so we look forward to that exhibition this fall and over the holidays. So hope Fantastic. to see you all again soon. All right. And thank you again. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.